that's uh that's the field i used to play on so it's fun fun times um let me kind of i'll do kind of like a little intro for everybody just people that don't know dr mickelson but i one of all first of all i appreciate him doing this for us this is just a really important thing i think for the pt community as well as potential clients out there that just want to get to know physicians more and also learn about in this case a little bit more about basketball injuries so with the tournament kind of getting revved up i thought this was a a good topic and Dr. Mickelson was totally on board. Um, but Dr. Mickelson was originally from outside of Milwaukee, sounds like, and yep. then transferred, his whole family moved out west here to Woodenville. And then uh, spent a lot of time in Woodenville, obviously had a successful basketball career at Woodenville High School and was recruited by Lehigh University. And so he was a four, four year letterman at Lehigh. Uh, which is super exciting. And they even had a chance to experience the tournament yourself. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, came back to the Northwest for medical school at University of Washington, did a residency at UW, and then did a residency at Duke. So in Duke, I believe you were covering a lot of major sports there as well. Yeah. So that's pretty exciting place to, between uh, Kostoszewski and uh, Cutliff, it's a pretty, pretty fun uh, sports school. Oh yeah, they live and they live and breathe all their sports. Yeah, um, now now obviously he's a physician and working at ProLiance uh, Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, and out of three locations. So currently Bellevue, Issaquah, Redmond. Uh, I had a chance to see at the Redmond office, which uh, was a super nice office there at Swedish off of Union Hill. Um, also a husband, father of two, and uh, author of over twelve papers, and then also yeah an athlete. I mean I think we all feel like we're still athletes, but you know, not maybe not to the level we were once at. So, no. um, but still, still uh, have your moments. I'm sure with the kids where you right. try to system can shine through. Uh, was there anything I missed there, or anything? No, you want to it, add? it was a pretty good summary. Okay, yeah, it was. Uh, it's been a, an adventure, but it's good to be back to the Northwest. And uh, just just a little background on this too. I've had a chance of meeting Dr. Mickelson for like the last four or five years at the Redmond High School Career Day. Um, so Cheryl's done a great job of getting a professional panel together, uh, different medical providers that students might have an interest in. And so that's where we first met. And he was a great uh, representative, I thought, for orthopedic surgeons and giving kids a, a true feel of what it is to be an orthopedic surgeon and the journey that it is. It's a very long one, expensive and uh, stressful. So I think to finally make it through is, is, a, is a feat in itself. The, uh, the other thing, too, is that Dr. Mickelson also covers Redmond High School, which is where I went. So it holds it's a part in my heart near and dear. And so he's taking care of all the Redmond High School athletes. And we're excited, obviously, with uh, opening the Redmond Clinic to be working with you more often. So that's going to be really, really fun for Sean and the team at the Redmond location. So without further ado, I'll let you kind of get going. And we have some questions that uh, we'll share at the end. So there'll be some Q&A. Uh, make sure to message those in the Q&A portion of the screen and we will uh i'll let you kind of take it from here great well thanks ben good to be here um it's seemed very fitting this time of year to, to talk about basketball injuries um and i appreciate ben and lake washington therapy um inviting me to, to join you all for this afternoon um chat um if any questions come up um please let us know i'm happy to answer them at the end this is more of an overview of just common injuries, no deep dives into all the specifics of, tr of treatments and surgeries and stuff, but I'm happy to talk and touch on any of those uh, themselves. I, I had a little about here at the start, but he kind of already touched base. I went to Lehigh University. I was a computer engineer actually, and I was gonna do medical engineering and then switched into medicine because I liked the medical portion at all. I played uh, basketball there. This is an old picture. I did really play. Uh, this is back in the day and uh, I met my wife there she was on the women's team um, I dragged her back out uh, out here to um, Washington for med school that was four years residency which is another five years and then uh, I went into my sports fellowships in, um, so in orthopedics you can specialize in different areas it's optional but I specialize in sports medicine so Duke is a great place to go cover sports on the sidelines take care of all the athletes learn all the ins and outs of working on a, in a sports team taking care of the student athletes and then treating all the common injuries, uh, which are rotator cuffs and ACLs and meniscus injuries, and then learning and dabbling in, in other th areas um, as well. So I come back out here, I'm part of ProLiance. So there's a bunch of different ProLiance groups. We're ProLiance Orthopedics and Sports Medicine or POSM, POSM. We've got three clinics. Our, our main one is basically in Issaquah. We've also uh, run a large clinic out of Bellevue near 
Overlake. And then I'm right now in our um, Redmond office here, uh, which is nice right off Union Hill Road. I, I can turn it this way. We've got this beautiful view of the wetlands out back. So all these clinics here have probably the best views of all of our, all of our clinic rooms um, on the east side here. So people like to hang out in the rooms here, though we try not to make you wait for very long. So um, on to the final four. So it's March Madness. This is my favorite time of the year. Um, it's basketball. Um, I really enjoyed, you know, watching the brackets come out this year even though my favorite teams, which are Lehigh, my alma mater, didn't win the Patriot League and make it to the tournament. And Duke, for like the first time since 95, had a not-so-great season and didn't make the tournament either. So I'm going to have to chain my horse back to Gonzaga, who I've liked since I was like a kid and moved here. And that was when they went through their big runs. So I think they got a good chance this year, like they should have had last year. But um, because it's March Madness, people are getting into basketball again, and they will again this, this uh, winter when uh, the seasons come back out. And so there's a lot of common injuries that go with them. I hope everybody's working on their, on their brackets. I haven't finalized mine, um, but it's going to be an exciting, an exciting uh, March to finally have basketball back out there. So basketball injuries are really common. Believe it or not, it's actually probably the most common sport to have injuries uh, out of all the sports. We think football and um, some other areas where there's really high contact, but they're wearing pads. Um, there's a, a lot in basketball because you're using your hands, you're cutting and pivoting, you're jumping. There is uh, less, uh, you know, gear supporting and protecting people. Um, and so, as you can see on this, um, this information, uh, women, which is in the red, are actually much more common than men. Uh, in most all sports, they have a higher propensity to injuries. But basketball, right along with bicycling, um, are very common places to injure yourself, uh, followed by baseball and soccer and, and football. Uh, in basketball itself, there's multiple areas that people injure themselves very commonly in warming up or inadequate warming up. But as you can see, the majority are from general uh, playing injuries um, and then also from landing a lot, uh, landing on somebody uh, or landing awkwardly um, or where the mechanics are off can cause injury, followed by a lot of uh, other training issues or the actual jumping itself. So we're just going to kind of cut through the top 10 um, most common sports injuries to start kind of basic stuff like strains and contusions. Um, muscle strains like hamstrings and groin pulls are very common. They're usually caused by a rapid accelerated activity and, and typically uh, for our weekend warriors, inadequate warming up or a, or a maintained program. Um, for those things, usually they sometimes have a previous injury or muscle strain that kind of predisposes them to it. Um, and it's typically in the muscle itself or sometimes in the muscle tendinous junction where the muscle transitions into the tendon, which is where the loads can sometimes cause those types of injuries. Um, the treatments are uh, mostly always conservative. It's usually icing and then heating to warm the muscle, anti-inflammatories or Tylenol. Sometimes um, if they're really bad, uh, we protect their weight bearing with some crutches um, for comfort. And then physical therapy, like at Lake Washington, is, is a key part of the recovery process. So they can do modalities such as stem or ultrasound and stretching and eccentric strengthening types of activities um, and exercises um, in the office and then for you to do on your own. Rarely, um, and these are kind of newer things, PRP is used. It's basically where we draw some of your blood, um, like 60 cc's of your blood, which is a much smaller amount than what they do when they draw your blood for a, a donation. And we spin that down in a centrifuge and pull out um, just the platelets and the rich plasma. Um, those have been found to have anti-inflammatory effects, um, healing factors, growth factors that uh, can be ejected throughout the body. But the most, uh, the best data uh, out of Europe and the US has been for tendon injuries or tendinopathies, or uh, they've been used in like acute high level athletes in college and football. Um, and then NBA uh, for uh, strains and injuries to the muscle, they've been injecting them within the first 24, 48 hours, and they found that they uh, can be helpful, though there's still data that has to be, uh, long-term data that has to be done, and they uh, are not covered by insurance yet. They're, they're usually cash pay. Contusions are also very common, basically a bad Charlie horse, direct impact to the muscle, bleeding into the muscle, sometimes into the skin, which causes a bruise. And those are also tre uh, treated symptomatically uh, with rehab, and then a gradual return to play, depending on the severity of that injury. Sometimes it can take days um, or keep them out the week or even for a, a few weeks uh, for games. Concussions, I'm also not going to touch on uh, in depth, but uh, those are very common, especially in high school. We see those a lot in football um, on the sidelines when we cover the teams and also um, 
in basketball, a lot of folks can uh, run into each other, hit heads. It's usually a direct impact. It's basically a, a, a brain bruise, it can come different varieties, but they typically have headache and dizziness. They're disoriented or very sensitive to the light. They're immediately removed from competition or should stop playing because um, they can have a double hit phenomenon and cause further injuries. They're evaluated and monitored to make sure it's not something uh, more severe like a, a, a subdural hematoma. Um, and then they're rested and there's a specific protocol that's usually followed where they're monitored um, and kept from you know, reading bright lights, uh, lots of uh, intensive you know, screen time to allow the brain to recover gradually and then um, return to play, which can sometimes take you know, a week or longer. Next, the fingers, hands are really badly injured commonly. Um, they're grabbing for balls, going for steals. Um, the ball basically will directly impact right on the edge of the finger. Um, and that's what people will say when they jam their finger. They come in different shapes and sizes. Um, it's typically swelling either in the finger or in the joint itself, uh, along with loss of motion and function. Sometimes the bad ones can be dislocated where the joint actually separates from the other joint and has to be pulled on and reduced. There's also something called a mallet finger where the tendon that uh, comes and extends the finger actually disrupts from its attachment on the end of the finger here. And so the finger will drop and can't be actively extended. Um, and that's a common type of injury when it's directly impacted. And then fractures, a broken finger uh, can also happen. Um, but most of them are just impacts to the joints themselves. The treatments, if it's, re if it's a dislocation, would be, would be a reduction, which is usually just longitudinal traction and pulling with the correction of the deformity. Ice anti-inflammatories, a lot of times they can be buddy tapes, just basically wrapping it to the, the joining finger um, to provide stability. And many can return to play um, depending on how their comfort is. Um, and then sometimes for a mallet finger, uh, the splint, as you can see on the bottom there, helps keep the finger in a straight position to allow that to heal back. And like I said, the surgery is rarely needed, sometimes for fractures or very unstable dislocations, uh, but the majority can return semi, uh, you know, fairly quickly, uh, depending on, on the type of injury, just knowing that they're at risk for a re-injury, but typically some immobility and some taping can protect it and allow them to still function in their sport activities. So the ankles are also very commonly injured. Uh, they're cutting and, and, um, and moving. Sometimes they're being crossed over and, and tripping on themselves. Um, so these are very common ankle, usually inversion injuries, which is where the ankle actually turns inward. Um, and it can also be from landing on somebody, jumping up, coming down, landing on a foot and causing the ankle to land awkwardly. Usually the lateral ankle ligaments, as you can see in this image down here, can be stretched. They come in different uh, severities. There's the ATFL or the anterior talofibular ligament and also the CFL, the, the calcaneal fibular ligament. And those uh, could be commonly uh, stretched out or even fully torn. Um, there's usually localized lateral ankle pain, swelling, loss of motion, sometimes pain with weight bearing. Some of this, uh, depending on the mechanism of the injury, can also happen when their um, ankle is turned and causes injury to the medial ligaments, which is called the deltoid. And so they can sometimes have some swelling over there. There's other higher ankle sprains um, that have to be ruled out, but these are the most common that we see. Um, the initial treatment is like it is for a lot of things on the sidelines or um, uh, in the gym after an injury. It's resting, it's icing, it's compression, it's elevation or rice, immobility or immobilization in a uh, immobilized boot or sometimes an air cast. If you go to urgent care, they'll usually throw in one of those and then protected weight bearing, sometimes crutches for comfort, depending on the exam or severity of pain, pain with uh, severe bruising or, or pain with just weight bearing on the, on the ankle, that can uh, be concerning for a possible fracture of the ankle. And so x-rays are used to evaluate that. Typically, most of these uh, ankle sprains can take uh, a week or two to even over a month, uh, six weeks to, to rehab. It's usually a physical therapy and home exercise program for joint motion and strength and balance and agility. And then modalities such as ultrasound and stim and, and icing. Prevention is a key part of it, keeping your muscles strong. The muscles around it are a dynamic brace to the ankle itself. And so you want to really get those tuned up before you return to play. Um, and then they'll usually do a gradual return to sports with non-contact and then contact and then finally games. Um, ankle taping with a trainer at school or um, a brace, like a place of ankle brace here uh, can be helpful. Usually the ones that have the straps that kind of come up and around and through um, provide some extra stability and can be used to provide uh, extra support. Fractures, like I touched on, can also happen if it's a really severe ankle injury. It's usually when the forces are so strong that the bones are put on tension or twisted and fracture. They come in different types of fracture injuries, but typically um, they're treated with non-weight bearing and immobilization and x-rays. 
If it's a stable fracture where sometimes just the tip of the bone has been pulled off by a ligament, it's called an avulsion. Those can be treated non-surgically with just some uh, immobilization in a boot or a splint and um, they will heal back on their own. But if it's a fracture more at the level of the ankle joint or higher um, and has some type of instability of the ankle joint, those need to be stabilized with surgery um, and usually are done with uh, open reduction and fixation, which is just a fancy way of saying we, we make an incision, we go in and we reduce or click the bones back in together like uh, puzzle pieces under x-ray and direct, directly looking at them. And then we fix them with uh, plates and screws to hold the ankle stable. Those usually are, are immobilized for about a few weeks in a, in a splint and a boot and not able to start walking for about six to eight weeks. So those can take a, a lot longer to, to heal than, a, than just a sprain. The knees are one of my, my areas of, uh, of, of interest. There's a lot of, of common injuries around the knee. Some of these are just from playing the sport and growing. Um, Ajgut Slaughters is one that I, I even battled myself. Basically, um, the growth plates are still open in kids uh, and adolescents. And one of the ones to close a little bit later is called the tibial tubercle. And that's basically where the kneecap, let's see, I got a bottle here, where the kneecap um which is right here this is, a, this is a knee looking from the front this is the outside of the knee the inside of the knee and the kneecaps right here kneecaps attached to a tendon here and then um all the way down to uh the tibial tubercle which is when the the quadricep muscle pulls it it straights the knee out and so that that uh apophysis which is a growth plate where this uh, tendon attaches takes a while to close down and so while it's still a growth plate it can be repetitively pulled on and cause inflammation at that area that can actually fragment the bone a little bit and that can cause pain and swelling and uh, enlargement of that tibial tubercle, which is called Ajgut Slaughters. It's, it's typically seen in adolescents, very commonly in basketball players, um, not necessarily from a direct injury, but more from an overuse with the growth plates open and it's vulnerable to this repetitive pulling and jumping. The exam is pretty classic. They're tender right there, it's swollen. Um, X-rays can show that the growth plates are still open, that there sometimes is a little bit of bone fragmentation in that area. Um, and it's typically treated with rest and um, treatments of their symptoms and then um, some stretching to strength, uh, to stretch out their muscles and tendons. Typically for folks like myself, they go through a growth spurt, they can grow quickly, their bones can grow, but sometimes their muscles and tendons take a little longer to, to come to catch up. And so they can be put on high tension. And then when that happens, um, you can sometimes offload that area with a little bit of a strap called a show pass strap, like in the picture down there. But usually early recognition, early intervention, shutting them down, letting things calm down. These typically resolve as they grow older. There's no cure immediately, but once their growth plates heal and close down, they don't really deal with this anymore. Rarely do they have some residual tendinopathy or, or um, bony obstacles there that cause problem and have to be excised. Telephone syndrome, we also see a lot of um, females more than males. It's basically generalized anterior knee pain with jumping stairs, sit to stand. It's usually an imbalance of the knee tracking, x-rays, MRIs. Those are all typically unremarkable. Sometimes in folks, as they get a little older, they get a little cartilage wear uh, behind the kneecap. Instead of it being nice and smooth like this, like then of a chicken bone, it gets a little roughened, um, get a little frayed, sometimes crunches or grinds when they bend their knee. And so those can be uh, painful, but they're all kind of treated the same, which is conservatively trying to rebalance the tracking of the knee and, and treat the symptoms. Um, usually it's caused by hip weakness, leg weakness. The knee basically uh, flexes in called dynamic valgus. When they bend their knee instead of tracking nice and straight, the hip abductors are weak. They come in, sometimes they have pes plantar or fat, flat feet that pronate, cause the whole knee to follow them inward. Dynamic valgus is one of the key problems with their tracking um, that causes the knee to track off a little bit and become symptomatic. So it's typically therapy, 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 symptom management, topical oral medication. Rarely is anything in, in, uh, invasive like an injection or anything like that necessary or anything surgical. Um, it's just treated with symptom management and improving their, their biomechanics. So with cutting and pivoting, the meniscus uh, can be injured. The meniscus on this image here, um, there's medial and lateral, lateral meaning the outside, medial meaning the inside. Um, those meniscus are the shock absorbers that sit between the knees and then the ligaments accompany them. They help provide the stability. So the ACL is inside of the knee here. Um, right here provides uh, stability front to back and pivoting. There's the medial on the, on the inside here and the lateral collateral ligaments. And then there's a posterior cruciate ligament on the back that provides kind of a posterior uh, stability of the knee. And then inside of it is this meniscus here. And that's the shock absorbing part of those people run and jump. They land awkwardly, twist, sometimes squat really far down and crunch on the back of that meniscus. They can cause that shock absorber to tear. It's usually some type of acute twisting injury or knee. They're usually very painful, sometimes swollen. 
They sometimes have some mechanical locking and catching symptoms, and they usually have problems with loading and twisting or squatting really far down um, from a flat bother on them. There's some severe ones called bucket handle tears where the whole meniscus actually tears and flips over on itself inside the joint and their knees in a locked position. Those are much more urgent to take care of. But the treatment, um, our symptom management to start, get the swelling and inflammation down, and then a lot of times they need to be evaluated with an MRI, uh, initially an X-ray to rule out any bony abnormalities. But the definitive treatment depends on many factors, um, depending on their age or injuries, the type of tear, their activity level. Um, but for basketball injuries, if there's a big flap in there, typically that's treated with um, a partial meniscectomy. So in the top picture, that's a flap of cartilage, if you can imagine getting caught there as they twist and move. And if it's a non-repairable or a small flap, those can be removed. Some treated non-operatively, peripheral ones, ones that might heal or aren't symptomatic or cause mechanical symptoms can be treated with an injection or rehab. Um, and then some like the picture down here can be repaired. So if there's certain tears that can be repaired side to side or repaired top to bottom, um, we go in there arthroscopically with a small camera and small tools and basically sew those meniscus tears back together and allow them to heal. They take a lot longer to recover from because we have to let that, that tissue heal um, but they can get back, you know, eventually to their sport, just a little longer than the meniscectomies. For ligament injuries, these are come in contact and non-contact flavors. They're usually pain, swelling, loss of motion, and, and the sense of instability. Ligaments can be partially injured, fully injured, and they come in different grades. But we can typically kind of dial in on what we think is injured based on our exam and stressing those ligaments and seeing where people are painful. X-rays can sometimes show avulsions or little bony fragments that have been pulled off and give us a sense to where the injury has happened. But an MRI is a definitive uh, evaluation here that we need to, to see to, to look at the surfaces of the, of the knee and also look at the ligaments to see what they've been injured and how they've been injured. And depending on what's injured, it varies. So this is an image of, of Steph Curry. He has a, a valgus injury, which means his knee kind of buckled in on him and he strained his MCL, that ligament on the inside of his knee. Um, sometimes it's also when the knee's planted and somebody hits you from the outside. You see that a lot in football, they get a, la a lateral to medial impact and their foot is planted and that causes the knee to buckle in and strain the inside ligament. We also see this a lot in, in skiing right now uh, with folks and they can be a mild injury all the way up to a complete tear. Um, some certain avulsions are treated uh, and repaired back, but the majority of these uh, can be treated conservatively with non-operative treatment. We let time for those to heal. It's a big ligament, good blood supply, a lot of tissue over there. And with rest and, and ice and anti-inflammatories and a brace to provide some stability to the knee, um, these can be uh, treated non-surgically and basically heal in. So on this image here, we can see where the MCL was injured on the inside. And those, since it's outside of the joint um, and uh, has a high likelihood of healing, they rarely cause recurrent instability. They can usually get back to all their activities. Rarely do they need to be reconstructed or, or rebuilt by a surgeon or augmented or backed up to tighten it up a little bit. More commonly, if they have what's called a multi-ligament knee injury where they have multiple ligaments that have been injured. But usually adequate rehab, bracing, um, those can be helpful. Sometimes return to sports where you can put people back into functional braces though they can affect their performance. Commonly done in like uh, defensive or offensive linemen in football where they're gonna get uh, hit a lot, people fall on their legs, less so uh, in basketball. ACL, I'm sure everybody's heard of that. That's an anterior cruciate ligament. That's the one that provides front to back and pivoting stability. It's very common, more in females than males. And it's a much more serious injury than some of the other ligaments. We see them a lot. It's usually an abrupt change in direction, cutting and pivoting or, or incorrect landing mechanics where you come down on a bent knee. Typically, uh, this provides um, lack or you lose the stability of your knee. And so to try to get back to those types of activities, such as basketball, where you need to cut and pivot, the knee is not stable and can shift on you and cause a pivot shift type of injury, which can damage meniscus, cartilage, other ligaments in the knee. Um, sometimes uh, people have a, just a light sprain where the ligament's overall intact. There's a few fibers that might've been injured or some edema. And based on the exam and some rehab, those sometimes can be treated non-surgically, um, but a complete tear is typically treated surgically. Rare ones can be repaired. So a lot of people say, oh, I had an ACL repair, but when in fact they actually had a reconstruction, meaning we rebuilt it for them with tissue. Um, some of the newer techniques to actually acutely repair an ACL back on, I've done a, a handful of them. It's uncommon. There's, I have a very narrow criteria to be a candidate, but it's basically an acute injury with an avulsion right off of the femur. And that um, if you can get to that tissue early and actually push it, put, repair it right back up to that femur and get it to heal, they can do quite well. The recovery I've found to be a little bit quicker than a re full reconstruction. With a reconstruction, we're actually taking tissue either from the patient or from a cadaver 
and reconstructing, rebuilding that tendon by drilling holes and suspending or fixating that tissue into the knee. Usually um, we use their own tissue, uh, either part of their bone tendon, bone patella, their hamstring or their quadriceps tendon. Um, I do offer allografts sometimes to folks, but it's usually people with uh, lower impact activities, lower uh, activity lifestyles, and they're much older in like their 50s or, or, or older. Typically the data shows that if your own tissue is better when you're in your, your teens, your 20s, your 30s, you know, I don't even offer it to people until they get into their upper 40s, especially in young people in their teens and 20s. It's been very well shown that um, allograft is not a good option for them. Typically a season ending injury, they have to do a little bit of rehab ahead of time to do, uh, get their knee ready for surgery. And then um, getting them back you know, to sports is usually a nine to 12 month recovery for a return to those sports um, just to get the muscles back and, and all firing in sequence and back to the level that they need to be. Typically we wanna see about 90% as strong as the other side when we do side to side testing um, in that time frame. Tendinitis, also these tendinopathies are very common. Patellar tendinitis or jumper's knee is, is one that we see all the time. Basically, um, itis meaning inflamed, so the tendon is inflamed. It's usually an overuse injury, um, muscle tightness, getting back into things too quickly. Um, previous possible tendon uh, problems uh, predispose them to this. Um, it's basically what we've talked about already, a break from activity, rest, ice compression, elevation, um, rehab for stretching and eccentric strengthening, some modalities. And then uh, for the patella, similar to the Ajgasaris, a uh, show pat strap or the strap around the kneecap can be very helpful. Or for an Achilles, really bad case, we'll put a boot to start. And then sometimes a sleeve or some heel lifts just to offload that patellar tendon, or sorry, uh, Achilles tendon. Um, and most of these get better on their own. There's been some newer stuff, more you know, semi-invasive, um, but not surgical um, with PRP or 10X, which is basically a percutaneous time where under ultrasound guidance, you can actually bring this needle, which ultrasonically goes in and debrides and basically irrigates, aspirates that tissue. And basically it's also creating uh, a, a local inflammatory response and in allowing things to heal, rarely going in and debriding the tendon or repairing a, a high grade, you know, partial tearing of it is necessary. Um, this isn't a, a, you know, a patellar tendon rupture. Those are much more of an acute injury that are a quad tendon where that has to be repaired right away. Tendon injuries, this is a, a picture of uh, Kevin Durant after he ruptured his Achilles. Um, there was a good video on there of actually the immediate slow motion of it happening and seeing everything coiling up kind of into his calf. But basically the gastroc still has come down in this picture below into the uh, Achilles tendon and that goes and inserts on the heel. And uh, with a big eccentric load or a sudden pushing off, um, sometimes that load is so forceful that it can actually tear that tendon. And this, sometimes people have a pre, you know, predisposition to it for any number of reasons. Sometimes um, they've had tendinopathies or, or other issues with that area. Um, but typically when you see them in exam, they've got a bunch of swelling, bruising, some muscle cramps up high because the muscle's all balled up. And then they're very tender. They have a point area that you can feel a deficit. And then you do a Thompson test where you squeeze on their calf and their foot doesn't move, whereas it should uh, typically um, on that exam. So usually this can be uh, diagnosed in the clinic. It doesn't need imaging, but if it does get imaging, you usually can see a, a gap in the tendon, either by ultrasound um, or MRI. And risk factors, like I said, is poor flexibility, um, sometimes steroid use or fluoroquinolones, which is an antibiotic which has been shown to have an increased propensity or risk uh, for tendon injuries and then fecal that are, are tight or infrequently exercised. Um, for these, um, they can be treated uh, surgically and non-surgically. There's been some studies that show that if you get them uh, right away, put them in a plantar flexion splint, um, and then kind of cast them there, and then gradually put them in a boot and start raising them up once the tendon is starting to heal, that you, they can do quite well with a functional protocol for folks that are playing higher level sports, quickly uh, repairing them directly and getting them into a uh, functional protocol do better, um, slightly lower risk of re-rupture, especially for higher level athletes. After surgery, they're usually immobilized for a while with the physical therapy protocol to work on, on, on strengthening range of motion within certain limitations. They'll eventually go to a boot with lifts and then those lifts will be decreased and then they'll wean out of, of that boot and start walking normally, but it can take a number of months to recover from. So in summary, we touched on a lot of these things. Lots of different injuries, kind of a, a little overview of all the common things we see and how kind of generally they're treated. Um, but I'm happy to dive into any of them further. 
if anybody has any specific questions, um, thank you for your time. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much. The great, great information as, uh, as we'd expect. You're awesome. My, my first question actually here was uh, through the q and I mean, I've got a list of questions that people sent in ahead of time as well. Uh, this is from Sean Burneman, who actually is going to be running our clinic in Redmond. He says, hi, Dr. Mickelson, I'm looking forward to working with you soon. What information do you rely on to clear athletes for return to sport? Could you answer this question for conservatively managed acute injuries and also for post-operative rehab? Specifically, I guess, what, what do you want the PTs to look for to feel confident in your decision? Yeah, so it's, um, I mean, I have a specific uh, kind of functional sports assessment that I, I like folks to use um, for post-operative patients um, within the time frame of that injury. Sometimes for small contusions and injuries, um, they don't necessarily need to see me back. The therapist uh, can clear them with the assistance of a uh, you know, athletic trainer uh, at school who it's nice to have everybody in communication or even the trainer can, can clear people for contusions or light stuff like that. But it's typically that, um, you know, the things we think about on the sidelines is, you know, if they're medically safe to return and then if they're, you know, uh, athletically okay to turn to, to return. And that's if first it is safe, are they going to injure something? And then are they able to protect themselves like in football? And so those are the first criteria up to me. That's pretty obvious. And then it's really, Basically, their their strength, their motion. We want their motion to be returned. We want them, you know, walking and running normally. We want their functional strength to be basically up to par to be able to participate. Sometimes, even even if they're at that medical level, they might not be to the level where their coach wants them to be back to the level that they can to play at the pre-injury level. Um, but for like my ACLs, um, you know, we usually want them to do side to side testing. I want them at least ninety percent or better um, than the contralateral side. Obviously, there's there's some gray area in there because if they haven't adequately treated their other side or say they completely ignore their other side, that right. strength is actually that you're comparing it to that's a low bar. Nine can, <laughs> can vary or skew those results. But typically, you know, um, some objective um, patient uh, outcome scores you know, to see how they're doing and tracking them, uh, balancing tests, strength tests, agility tests, and then you know, side to side muscle objective measurements, hop tests, those types of things. And you want to be within that 90 percent yeah that's a great answer i think the return to sport is kind of the the trickiest thing and i think for no, there's no perfect answer it's no. I mean, the time frame there is how are they looking how are they functioning how are they feeling and then you know sometimes the worst patients are the ones that are doing so well that they're ready to go back and you're like no you're not you're not ready yet your yeah. body's not quite look at these numbers yeah i think i think the the real important thing too in my mind is you when you have a, a physician that was an athlete they have a much better concept of like the, the clearance being more legitimate where I think a lot of times docs will just be like, Hey, okay, I think you're good. And it's like, well, good. Like you said, good to be done seeing them is one thing, but like to actually get out and scrimmage and yeah. to take trauma to the knee or the ankle is kind of a different thing. Yeah. Uh, here's kind of a question that you answer usually yearly, but this is kind of a good one. And that is how did you decide on medicine? Cause we, I know you have an interesting background that you might want to touch on too. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was, my dad worked in medical electronics, so they built MRI and CT machines, so I was kind of going that direction. I went to Lehigh, and in addition to playing basketball, studying engineering, but then I kind of was working towards medical engineering, and I spent a couple summers shadowing in medical electronics, where Phillips actually up in Bothell, and, uh, and then I spent time at the hospital, and I kind of realized, for me personally, I, I didn't really like the sitting in a cubicle and, and just programming and doing the engineering work. I really liked being out there, and then working with the patients, um, and then my sports background, people kind of always put me in a corner that I was going to be an orthopedic doctor. And I was like, no, no, I might, maybe I'll like something else. And in the end, it really was a good fit. I mean, the sports side just comes naturally and um, it's just a great area to be in. And I kind of went through that trial and error. And even in college, my wife can contend, I kind of went all over the place on where I was going to end up and finally decided on medical school. And it's, it was been quite a journey, but it's definitely on this side now well worth it. And uh very rewarding to get people back back out there and see them back on the field playing after they injured themselves the previous season. And, and how long have you been involved with Redmond up there? Because it's been a oh, number of years. Oh, what is it now? I mean, the whole COVID stuff has kind of got all the, the numbers up. I think it's been three or four years now. Um, yeah, so I take care of I take care of Redmond High School. I take care of uh, Bellevue College, um, Issaquah High School. Also, um, I've been helping with, but we've got a bunch of different doctors and sports on our staff here at Possum that help cover. Um, all the different schools in the area. Um, so that's, that, that's a, that's a perfect segue to, uh, I don't want to be respectful of your time, but 
got a couple more, and that is COVID. So what do you foresee or what's your forecast for injuries and, and trauma as we return both to high school sports as well as co-ed rec leagues at, at Microsoft, City of Redmond, City of Bellevue, and that sort of thing? It's, uh, there's going to be an increase. I mean, um, people have been sitting around for a year. I mean, we're already seeing it. Um, there was, you know, a lot of ski injuries this year, more than normal. People, I think, just itching to get out there and do something. Um, a lot of, a lot of deconditioned things, a lot of overuse stuff, um, tendinopathies, cellophenal syndrome. People are getting tight hamstrings, sitting for, you know, all the time. And now they're getting back there and trying to get back to their pre-COVID levels um, or even during COVID, trying to get back or into something new. Uh, that might they might not have otherwise done um, without a guidance of a therapist or a trainer and stuff that aren't available. And so we've been seeing a lot of those injuries. I mean, I just covered Redmond's first football game this last uh, Saturday, and they had a lot of um, strains and cramps um, just because they haven't played. I mean, you can't simulate the game even with practices in these pods and everything. So it was great to see everybody out there, but we are definitely going to see, you know, uh, more injuries um, and overuse injuries. We, we see a lot, uh, believe it or not, at, at Microsoft, we see a lot of folks that injure themselves at, like lunchtime. And now that everybody's at home right now, we, we're not seeing those injuries, but there are a lot of, you know, lunchtime sports injuries that I'm sure will reoccur. Yeah, those, field, those fields up there are awfully nice. Yeah, a quick, you actually are creating great segues. So when it comes to overuse, and I know I've talked to a number of physicians and, and you and I both see parents every day, that have really pushed their kids, especially pre-COVID. And now as we get back into things, like what, what is your definition of kind of overuse or what's too much for a kid uh, when they're playing? That's a, that's a slippery slope. It's hard to say. I mean, it depends on the age. I mean, especially we see kids with little league or shoulder and elbows where they're throwing tons of pitches. I mean, that some of these national societies have really kind of toned down what they recommend as far as pitch counts and things like that. I mean, I, I play basketball every day when I was a kid. Um, I think there's with clubs though, and then year round clubs and high school sports and then trainers or personal, you know, people that uh, are doing additional training, higher level training um, on the side, there can be uh, too much. And so that being said, you know, it's a competitive, you know, competitive arena out there. And so you kind of got to stay ahead, but you got to be cognizant that, a correct warming up is important. Um, listening to your body is important and not pushing through. Um, and then knowing that, you know, you need to take time for breaks, active recoveries, things like that are, are an important part of it. Um, but I can't put a number on like the exact amount of hours or minutes because that's the part of, of the of sports medicine is you kind of have to talk to the families and say, hey, you know, we can get them there, but is it safe long term? Uh, what is a short-term outcome or outlook for taking a break to get you back out so you can play for your you know, high school and college. So it varies on yeah. the, age and the activity level and what, what they're all doing. It's tough. Like you said, the landscape is very competitive. And I think the push for specialization happens earlier and earlier, much earlier than when you and I were competing at the high school level. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a question we get very often uh, from parents that are concerned and some parents you actually have to slow them down. You know, it's kind of a, and many times it's being driven by the parents and not so much by the athlete. And actually when you see the athlete alone, they're like, you know, I really don't want to play yeah, no, soccer. No, no. <laughs> um, there's a good question from Glenn Peterson. Uh, is there a medical procedure that will help, help my jump shot? Hashtag bricklayer. <laughs> So, uh, I don't think so. No. Okay. Yeah, that would work with somebody that works on your shooting form. You have to have a transfusion from Steph or something. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think PRP and stuff has been shown to, to help jump shots. Um, outside of uh, Lehigh, what teams do you typically follow in the tournament? I know you kind of mentioned Gonzaga, but is there anybody? Yeah, I mean, I'll call, I'll, call, I'll watch uh, whoever comes out of the Patriot League, which was my alma mater, so Colgate's this year, and um, they're playing Arkansas, who my PA is like, all about so i really want them to beat arkansas <laughs> about it. um i like the i like watching the cinderella teams i mean i i got duke and lehigh and whoever's from the page league if uw or gonzaga's in it I, i'd cheer them on and i'm an old milwaukee boy so i like marquette uh, okay. nice uh, yeah. dwayne way dwayne era um favorite uh basketball player current or retired what's what's your oh when i was growing up i really liked pistol pete marovich so he had all these great he was an amazing ball handler a great point guard i had all of his videos on vhs i did all of his workouts that's like right when i like really peaked and started really getting to basketball i was like all about pistol pete marovich and so i think nice. he 
he's got still some records that stand to this day and watching some of his old stuff he was he was really good no i haven't seen you play live but who, who would you kind of say your game most resembles <laughs> oh i don't know are i don't more, know that's a hard one are you more like tom gugliotta or more kevin love yeah oh i was a, i was a role player i i was very good on defense i got a lot of rebounds i set a lot of screens i took a lot of charges uh, mm -hmm. i wasn't like the highest score on our team um in college and in, in, in high school i was much skinnier uh, i was like a stick back there when i went to woodenville and um so I, I i'd say i was a i was a tough player i was a smart player smart um, player i like that i like that um when, one final question what are your or do you have any comments about i know with the nba last year was kind of an anomaly with the bubble but on load management like what do you think of these athletes as they're looking to decrease minutes uh, obviously a long season especially playoffs and olympic teams and things what what do you think is uh makes the most sense for those athletes yeah it's a business it's your job um but at the same time it's their bodies and i mean it shows that you know, the more minutes they play, the more likely they are to have injuries, the more likely they are to not be at full, uh, at their full ability at the end of the season. So I think, you know, they have to be cognizant. And it's not just in the NBA. I mean, it's even in, in college, I mean, coaches are trying to manage injuries. They're trying to, to manage uh, their minutes. And I mean, I think it's a reasonable thing. You know, we already see in the NBA or in the NFL of people that have lasting problems uh, after playing a handful of years. I mean, it's, I'm in my late thirties now. And they're like, you know, if you're in your late thirties in the NBA, you're like an old guy. <laughs> so right, right, right. seeing the guys that I played with in college or at, in, in like AAU tournaments that I played with in my high school days. And they're like the old guys now in the NBA. It's they, <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta get the most out of your years, but you still have a lot of years to go after that. I wouldn't consider myself old, even though if you ask my kids that they. <laughs> you're, you're, you're past your prime to your kids for sure. Uh, one, one final question. This is from a, a PT, Zach Pemble, and he says, can you talk a little bit about the causes and or treatments for stress fractures to the tibia? Yeah, so tibial stress fractures are bad ones. I mean, they come stress fractures come in all shapes and sizes in different areas. The navicular in the foot is a bad one. The anterior tibia, the dreaded black line in, in the front of the, the shin bone here. It's usually farther down the tibia, but right in this area, people will get it. You know, sometimes it's a stress injury, it can be a, a uh, you know, tibial, medial tibial stress syndrome or shin splints, which is a little farther down, um, but usually pain over the, the shin there can be a problem. And when we see them, we kind of get x-rays um, to see if there's a black line there, how much of the cortices or the thick outside bone has been injured. If it gets all the way through, that's a bad actor. It really is. You got to shut them down, even completely have them made non-weight bearing. You have to basically let it make sure they have good calcium and vitamin D, check labs, give them supplements. Sometimes we even add in a bone stimulator if it looks like it's not healing. Um, but though that's an area that's a stress side of the bone. And so uh, anytime they walk, run, load, those um, are going to be stressed. And so it's important to try to get those to heal. If they don't, then it's an easy fix. You basically fix it like it's a fracture. You put a rod in the bone or a small plate on the outside, um, and then they can walk and run and do their stuff afterwards. But you try to avoid that. Um, and so it's important to give them time, shut them down. They hate hearing it because they're usually really, really right. big runners. They run a ton of miles, ultra marathon. I mean, the people that usually, it's like their livelihood because and what their body just can't keep up with it. And so that's an important thing to take really seriously. Yeah. Um, hey, well, I want to be aware of your time. I know you got clinic this afternoon. I really appreciate, yeah. Yeah, really I appreciate you taking the time. Um, is If you have patients that need to be sent your way what's the best way to for therapists trainers uh, chiropractors other physicians to send them your way is it just through the uh, main possum phone yeah uh, the possum posm.com website is typically the best place there's a, a request tab at the top or our okay. direct line center of our clinics okay excellent and is there anything else uh we need to know no. Okay. Hopefully well, everybody get, enjoys getting back out there to sports, be safe, warm up. Awesome. And uh, we're happy to help take care of you if we need to. Great. Well, hey, we will have this uh, talk will both be archived on Zoom as well as we'll throw it up on YouTube and kind of share that out on our social channels. But uh, I really appreciate the time. And again, always kind of great to connect uh, better in person, but this is uh, this will do for the, for yeah. the short term. Look forward to our next Redmond, our next Redmond 
uh, panelists I meeting. Know. But Next thank week. you again. Thank you for hosting this. Thanks for taking care of all of our patients over at Lake Washington PT. Appreciate it. You guys hey. do a great job. Thanks so much. Go Stangs. <laughs> all, right. all right. Take care, everybody.